Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kilrenny. If this is not where you would normally be on a Sunday morning, then you're very welcome. If this is where you always are on Sunday morning, you are equally welcome. And we should never forget that uh, this is a place of welcome and openness to all who want to worship. Welcome to those who are watching us later on online. Uh, I believe I have a following that might even be counted in one hand. So, uh, you know, me and YouTube, the internet, we're all over it. <laughs> Next Saturday afternoon, Anne Thompson is uh, running a jewellery stall at the Creole Street Festival. So, if you're able to support her in whatever means, if you've got jewellery with you today, then please pass, pass it on. If you can be there next week to come and buy the jewellery, that would be very good as well. So whatever you can do to help, I would appreciate, as will the church funds. We have tea and coffee after the service this morning, uh, so please come and join us in the church hall um, and have a chance to catch up with each other and catch up on all the news. Let us come and worship the Lord. Creator God, your story is unfolded through time. From far flung stars to intimate relationship, help us as we gather today to know and see you in new ways, in our songs and in our silence. Give us the courage to face our vulnerabilities and to sit with you, confident in your presence and your love for us. Amen. Let us come and worship the Lord. Let us praise him in our hymn, our opening hymn, hymn 400. 400. 364 um, of glory, Lord and honour. 364. <laughs>
come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, we glimpse your beauty in the sunrise, the mountain top, and the eagle's wing. We sense your power in thunder crash, lightning flash, and oceans roar. Creator God, we praise you. Precious Jesus, we see your love stretched out upon a cruel cross. We stand in awe at your sacrifice, pure love poured out for humankind. Precious Jesus, we praise you. Holy Spirit, we see your power in lives transformed, hearts on fire. We listen for your still small voice, comforting, guiding, calling. Holy Spirit, we praise you. From the moment we awake to face the day ahead, you are with us. Through good times and bad, your presence is enough for our needs. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever. Through the hours of the day in our travels and work, you are with us. In decisions we must make, your wisdom is enough for our needs. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever. As we lay down to rest at the end of the day, you are with us. As we lay our fears at your feet, your peace enough for our needs. Lord God, your love for humankind, present in the beginning of all things, extends through history and touches even <coughs> my life. Your love sees failings and forgives. Your love feels pain and wipes away our tears. Your love knows grief and comforts the sorrowful. Your love sees sin and still loves the sinner. Forgive us when we fail to live, living lives that reflect your love. Forgive us the many times when we take for granted all that you have done for us. Transform us through your Spirit and empower us to serve you this day and all days. And now, Lord, join our best breath, our voices together in the prayer you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. David, stay where you are. You get the story first. <laughs> CJ, do you want to come join me? We haven't quite got to the stage of writing the children's address into the order of service yet. But we'll see. Have a seat. Good morning. How are you? Good. Um, I'm going to put the shoes on first. The new shoes on. He's got a jumper with a pocket. Show them the pocket. A loop it. Yeah. Very handy. See, I've got a pocket too. The problem is my pocket's all stitched up so I can't keep anything in it. Mine isn't. Yours is not because yours has got your handkerchief in it. Excellent. Right. Will we have a story? Excellent. I've got another story for you this morning and it follows on from the one we had last week. This one's called Jesus Heals Jairus' Daughter. And this is a story about a man called Jairus and his little girl. There was once a man called Jairus who lived with his wife in a town called Capernaum. The couple had a daughter and they loved her more than anything. Now when their daughter was 12 years old she became ill. The best doctor in town was sent for but as the days went by the little girl grew worse. Jairus and his wife spent hours at their bedside trying to comfort her. One morning as Jairus was bathing his daughter with cool water he heard voices down by the shore. Capernaum was by Lake Galilee and the beach was a short walk from the house. What's going on? said Jairus to the servant. He was afraid the noise would disturb the sick child. 
Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth arrived by boat this morning, said the servant. He came with some friends. Jairus had heard so much about Jesus. He'd been told he had the power to heal people. And here he was in Capernaum. If anyone could help his daughter, it was Jesus. Without a word, Jairus left the house and ran outside. He hurried through the streets and down to the shore. Quite a crowd had gathered around Jesus. But when they saw Jairus coming, they made way for him. Jairus was an important man in town, and many people knew him. Jairus looks upset, said one. I wonder what he wants with Jesus, said another. Jairus ran up to Jesus and fell at his feet. Master, he said, please, come quickly. My daughter is very ill. Only you can make her well. If you don't come, she will die. Of course, Jesus said he would help. He could see that Jesus that Jairus trusted him completely, and that was very important. But on the way, something happened. There was a crowd following Jesus, bumping and jostling each other to stay close. Suddenly Jesus stopped and asked, Who touched me? Well, I asked him what question that is to ask. There were so many people pushing and shoving. Everyone went quiet. So Jesus asked again, Who touched me? As Jesus looked around, a frightened woman stepped forward. I touched you, said the woman nervously. I have been ill for many years and spent all my money on doctors. I knew if I could only touch the hem of your gown, I would be healed. So that was it. In all the hustle and bustle, at the very moment the woman had touched his cloak, Jesus had felt some healing flow out of him. Jesus looked at the woman with such kindness. Your trust in me has cured you, he said gently. Meanwhile, Jesus was getting more and more anxious. Every second counted of Jesus to make his daughter well. And yet he was stopping to heal this woman as if he had all the time in the world. Jesus was about to plead with Jesus to hurry up when he saw his servant coming to meet him. He had sad news. Your daughter is dead, he said. There is no need to trouble Jesus anymore. Jesus wept. His daughter had just died and the only man who could have saved him was so near. But Jesus simply turned to Jesus and said, Go on trusting me. Then he took three of his friends, Peter, James and John, and went to see the child. Jesus and his wife cried as Jesus sat down at the bedside. Jesus took the small, cold hand in his. Get up, my child, he said. The little girl's eyes flickered open. As she felt her strength returning, she sat up, smiled at Jesus, and jumped out of bed. You can imagine how thankful those parents were to see their daughter alive and well again. Jesus smiled at them. He loved children and it made them happy too. And now, he said, it's time to prepare some food. I think you'll find your daughter is hungry. That's a good story, isn't it? That's a lovely story. Yes? In that case, you better go. And you run up there. And you go. That's it. Excellent. Thank you all for listening so well. You're very good. David, go to you. Chapter 1, reading verses 15 to 28. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, <clears throat> by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and in which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which Christ in you, the hope in glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. The next hymn is hymn 577, Christ be beside me, 577. Feedback, hopefully it goes away. 
Let us sing again the hymn book, um, hymn 694. Brother, sister, let me serve you. 694. <coughs>
words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. Amen. The reading from Luke's Gospel about Jesus visiting Martha and Mary is very familiar to us and is often used as a stick to beat those who are regarded as being the doers in churches rather than the thinkers and listeners. I don't want to dwell on that particular well-trodden discussion today. Suffice it to say, we can recognise ourselves in the behaviours of both women. One was the sure guest feels welcomed and the hospitality is appropriate. The other feels her duty is to be with her guest and not leave him by himself while she busies herself with arranging the refreshments. Neither was in the wrong, but at that moment, Jesus appreciated Mary's actions more than Martha's. It seems he needed to rest more than being fussed over. All that being said, I'm certain Jesus would have appreciated the hospitality that was served later on. So let's turn our attention to Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Here we encounter a, a complex statement focusing on the identity and the nature of Jesus Christ as Son of God, as one with God, as an integral part of God. It seems that the statement about the nature of God and the Christ with God was a response to a heresy that was developing within the church in that city. Looking for details, the two commentaries I rely on most often have very different views on the importance of this heresy. My more recent commentary that spends very little time on focusing on the reasons for Paul writing this letter. It simply suggests that some in the church, in the Colossian church, had become enthralled by ideas of angels and other spiritual bodies to the cost of their faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. My other source of wisdom, Professor Barclay's commentaries on the books in the New Testament, offers much more detail and sees this letter as having a great significance in the development of the Christian faith. And, as a result, nip nipping a powerful heresy in the bud. So you'll not be surprised to know I've gone with Willie Barclay's interpretation and understanding of this reading. The background to Paul's letter is as follows. Colossae was a Greek city in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey to you and I. And it had been a very wealthy place, but it had lost its prestige. Its population was a mix of Greeks and other Gentiles living alongside a large Jewish community that had been established hundreds of years earlier. Paul never actually visited Colossae himself. But the Christian church had been established as a result of Paul's work in Ephesus. And that's just a hundred or so miles from Colossae. So Paul had been sending out co-workers to the various cities in the region. And Colossae was one. We think a man named Epaphras was the leading minister and may well have established a church in Colossae. Epaphras certainly is mentioned as being the leader of that church in Paul's greetings at the beginning of the letter. And it's likely that he had come to Paul at some time when Paul was in jail in Rome with news of how that church was growing and developing. It seems that the issue Paul was told about was what we call an early form of Gnosticism. Professor Barclay identifies this as the most likely possibility for the deviation from the faith that Paul and his followers have taught. The details of Gnosticism are too complex to go into detail this morning, you'd be delighted to know. However, the essence of it is as follows. Gnostics believe that God the Creator was a spiritual being who was completely good. However, the material world in which we inhabit was inherently evil, and God the Creator could not come in contact with that materialism because of its evil nature. The Creator God had then sent eminences into the world, and the more they became removed from God, 
the more they were able to handle this materialism. Eventually, they became so removed from God that they turned on God completely. That created the world in which the Gnostics believed we inhabit. This way of explaining the nature of God and the world left very little hope for individuals to be redeemed and experience the goodness of God. In order for that to happen, Gnostics argued that there were levels of secret knowledge that initiates could access, thus enabling the select few to reach a state of knowledge leading to redemption. I hope you're all still with me. The Greeks were prone to following those kinds of cults, and there was also a strand of Judaism that looked to secret knowledge as an explanation for a mean, as a means to access God's grace. Into this type of thinking, Gnostics were willing to acknowledge Jesus Christ as a high order eminence, but still far removed from God the Creator. Gnosticism was a belief system that required initiates to undergo testing, and it was designed as an incredibly exclusive club. In contrast to all of that, Christianity, early Christianity in particular, was regarded as a rather simplistic and unsophisticated faith. It lacked the philosophical underpinning that the Greeks expected and were familiar with. Therefore, Paul was being alerted to the threat of Gnostic thinking on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. All of that offers the rationale for Paul's emphasis in this passage on the oneness of God with Jesus Christ his Son. Paul's concern was to ensure that this heresy was stopped before it took a deep hole within that church and then began to spread out around the other new churches that had formed in the region. Paul was very aware that ideas, just like viruses, can spread and take hold very quickly. Christianity itself, after all, had grown rapidly across the Eastern Mediterranean, and in turn, other ideas could fall in its wake. In responding to the corruption of the faith, Paul developed a much stronger concept of the relationship between God and Jesus Christ. And in doing so, rejected the exclusive exclusivism and knew that word was never going to work. <laughs> Separateness that belief systems like Gnosticism proposed. Paul reminds us that we all have access and can have a personal relationship with God the Creator, as well as His Son Jesus Christ. Paul offers a more sophisticated understanding of God's relationship with these people, and he also helps to conceptualize how it could be that Jesus Christ was both human and God at the same time. In doing so, Paul also offers a direct connection between God and his people. Not for us the need to go through years of learning secret knowledge and testing, simply the sense that we are part of God's creation. A creation that is not evil, that is not estranged from God, but is beautiful and good. Gnosticism would go on to pose a genuine threat to Christianity for the next few hundred years. But at this moment, Paul addresses the threat head on and stops it in its tracks, at least for this point in time. You're saying to yourself, well that's all very interesting Mike, but what's that got to do with us? And your question is a good and fair question. My argument would be our faith continues to face threats. Some of those threats are physical, but many of them are ideological. There are those who continue to want to take away the individuality and the simplicity of our faith and turn it into something difficult and untouchable. In truth, the church has also made 
it more difficult for believers to follow and understand their faith over the centuries. The simplicity of the relationship we can have with Jesus is often viewed as too easy. Surely we must have to qualify in some way. But the reality is, we only require faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will take care of the rest. Like the Colossians, we need to ensure that we avoid the silent voices of those who try to deflect us from our faith. Those who would want to make our relationship with God more difficult. When what we need to remember is we have a place in God's heart already. And that he gave us, gave us his only son who dwelt in the world and dwells in each one of us. Faith is as much a feeling as it is an intellectual exercise. The Greeks loved intellectual exercises. They loved this idea of tapping into something exclusive and different. Don't get me wrong, I love Greeks and, and Greece, but the ancient world was very consumed by the philosophies of the day. Faith doesn't require tests and qualifications, initiations and rituals. We can overcomplicate faith, but in fact all that's required is a simple understanding that Jesus Christ came to save each one of us, giving his human life as a result, but ensuring that we could dwell within him and he in us. Remember what he said and what we read just a few weeks ago. If you want to access the kingdom of heaven, you must come to it as a child. And in that innocence of the child. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these words. Let us sing again from the hymn book, hymn 561. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, 561.
been raining all morning and it's quite gloomy looking out there, but you'll be many of you aware that certainly our neighbours down south are likely to experience very dangerous temperatures in the next week. So let's hold all those being affected by the heat wave in our thoughts and prayers. Let us come together to pray for thanks and for our world. Lord Jesus, we bring before you our offerings of money to be blessed to do your work in this church, in this parish and in the world. As we dedicate these gifts to you, so may we bring ourselves and our service to be dedicated to your work for your people in this place. Bless us as servants, as sisters and brothers, as your friends, following wherever you lead us. Blessed are you, Lord our God. You have given us the power of communication, eyes to see, ears to hear, and lips to speak. Teach us to be attentive to your word and to all who come to us each day. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give thanks for the stillness of the church and that you speak to us through silence. We pray for all who wait upon your word and seek to do your will. We pray for all pastors and counsellors, and all who are called to listen to the needs of others. We pray for religious communities, and for those who wait upon you in silence. Holy and mighty one, hear us and help us. Guide all our leaders in the ways of justice and peace. Keep our ears open to the cry of the poor and the oppressed. We pray for the work of Christian aid and all who seek to feed the hungry. Lord, teach us to be sensitive to each other. May we give time and attention where it is needed. We ask your blessing of peace on our homes and all who are dear to us. Holy and mighty one, hear us and help us. We pray today for all who are anxious and overworked, all who are well, all weary or deeply troubled. We remember especially any who feel the lack of love or attention, those who feel neglected or unwanted. We ask your blessing upon all who are ill and those who have been taken into care. Now, Lord, in the silence of our hearts, we bring before you all those we know of in need of your care, your comfort, your compassion, and your love. Holy and mighty one, hear us and help us. Lord, we give thanks that you attend to our needs and care for us through to eternity. We ask you to bless our friends and loved ones who have departed from this life and who now rejoice in the fullness of your kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us close our worship with hymn 248, for my sake and the Gospels go, 248. <coughs>
done to the needs of the world. May you know Christ goes before you, that there is nowhere you will be without him. May you find joy and hope as you discover Christ is by your side. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always.